Hello, thank you for joining with me. I am reading with the Course Companion group on Facebook by Emily Bennington and Robert Perry. We are on day 111, section 5 in chapter 7, the extension of the kingdom, and this section is the denial of power. If you would please join me in prayer. Dear God, if left to my own devices, my perception will be skewed. I surrender to you everything that I think and feel. God, please take my past, plant my future, send your spirit to redeem my mind that I might be set free. May I be your channel, God, and serve the world. May I become who you would have me be, do what you would have me do, go where you would have me go, and say what you would have me say, and to whom. Thank you, God, for your many, many blessings. Please enable me to set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience, especially with this reading and in this world today. Please give me Christ-like vision. Thank you, God. Amen. The Denial of Power You can think of the sonship only as one. This is part of the law of creation and therefore governs all thought. You can perceive the sonship as fragmented, but it is impossible for you to see something in part of it that you will not attribute to all of it. This is why attack is never discreet, and this is why attack must be relinquished entirely. And we'll go down and read footnote 35, text chapter 6, section 4. Safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. No compromise is possible in this. Teach attack in any form, and you have learned it, and it will hurt you. If it is not relinquished entirely, it is not relinquished at all. Fear and love are equally reciprocal. And then we'll go down to 36. Reciprocal here means that when you give fear or love, you will receive them in return. They make or create depending on whether the ego or the Holy Spirit begets or inspires them. But they will return to the mind of the thinker and they will affect his total perception. That includes his perception of God, of his creations, and of his own. He will not appreciate any of these if he regards them fearfully. He will appreciate all of them if he regards them with love. The mind that accepts attack cannot love. This is because it believes that it can destroy love and therefore does not understand what love is. If it does not understand what love is, it cannot perceive itself as loving. This blocks the awareness of being, induces feelings of unreality, and results in utter confusion. Your own thinking has done this because of its power, but your own thinking can also save you from this because its power is not of your making. Your ability to direct your thinking as you will is part of its power. If you do not believe you can do this, you have denied the power of your thought and thus rendered it powerless in your belief. The ingeniousness of the ego to preserve itself is enormous, but it stems from the power of the mind which the ego denies. This means that the ego attacks what it what is preserving it, and this must be a source of extreme anxiety. This is why it never knows what it is doing. This is perfectly logical, though clearly insane. The ego draws upon the one source which is totally inimical to its existence for its existence. Fearful of perceiving the power of this source, it is forced to depreciate it. This threatens its own existence, a state which finds it finds intolerable. Remaining logical but still insane, the ego resolves this completely insane dilemma in a completely insane way. 
It does not perceive its existence as threatened by projecting the threat onto you and perceiving your being as non-existent. This ensures its continuance if you side with it by guaranteeing that you will not know your own safety. The ego cannot afford to know anything. Knowledge is total and the ego does not believe in totality. This unbelief is its own origin. Why the ego does not love you, it is faithful to its own antecedent, begetting as it was begotten. 37. The ego's antecedent is its origin from earlier in the sentence. It's unbelief in totality. Mind always reproduces as it was produced. Produced by fear, the ego reproduces fear. This is its allegiance and this allegiance makes it treacherous to love because you are love. I'm going to repeat that because sometimes I feel like I slaughter, slaughter these words. This is its allegiance and this allegiance makes it treacherous to love because you are love. Love is your power which the ego must deny. It must also deny everything which this power gives to you because it gives you everything. No one who has everything wants the ego. Its own maker then does not want it. Rejection is therefore the only decision which the ego could possibly encounter if the mind which made it knew itself. And if it recognized any part of the sonship, it would know itself. The ego, therefore, opposes all appreciation, all recognition, all same perception, and all knowledge. It perceives their threat as total because it senses the fact that all commitments which the mind makes are total. Forced, therefore, to detach itself from who from you who are mind, it is willing to attach itself to anything else. But there is nothing else. It does not follow, however, however, that the mind cannot make illusions. But it does follow that if it makes illusions, it will believe in them because that is how it made them. The Holy Spirit undoes illusions without attacking them merely because he cannot perceive them at all. They therefore do not exist for him. He resolves the apparent conflict which they engender by perceiving conflict as meaningless. We said before that the Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is. Footnote 38, text chapter 6, section 7. The Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is. Let me find my way. Where am I? Ah. All right. So the Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is, and it is meaningless. The Holy Spirit does not want you to understand conflict. He wants you to realize that because conflict is meaningless, it cannot be understood. We said that nothing brings appreciation, and appreciation brings love. 39. Text chapter 7, section 4, understanding is appreciation, because what you understand you can identify with, and making it part of you, you have accepted it with love. Nothing else can be understood because nothing else is real, and therefore nothing else has meaning. If you will keep in mind what the Holy Spirit offers you, you cannot be vigilant for anything but God and His kingdom. 40. Text chapter 6, section 7. Be vigilant only for God and His kingdom. The only reason why you find this difficult is because you think there is something else. Belief does not require vigilance unless it is conflicted. If it is, there are conflicting components within it which have engendered a state of war, and vigilance has therefore become essential. Vigilance has no place at all in peace. 
It is necessary only against beliefs which are not true and would never have been called upon by the Holy Spirit if you had not believed the untrue yourself. But you cannot deny that when you believe something, you have made it true for you. When you believe what God does not know, your thought seems to contradict his, and this makes it appear as if you are attacking him. We have repeatedly emphasized that the ego does believe it can attack God and tries to persuade you that you have done this. Footnote 41. Text chapter 5, section 6. The ego is the part of mind which believes in division. But how can part of God detach itself without believing it is attacking him? We spoke before of the authority problem as involving the concept of usurping, of usurping his power. Sorry, The ego believes that this is what you did because it believes it is you. Text chapter 5, section 6. Listening to the ego's voice means that you believe it is possible to attack God. You believe that a part of him has been torn away by you. Okay. If the mind cannot attack God, the ego proceeds perfectly logically to the position that you cannot be mind. By not seeing you as you are, it can see itself as it wants to be. Aware of its weakness, the ego wants your allegiance, but not as you really are. The ego therefore wants to engage your mind in its own delusional system, because otherwise the light of your understanding will dispel it. The ego wants no part of truth, because the truth is is that it is not true. If truth is total, the untrue cannot exist. Commitment to either must be total because they cannot coexist in your mind without splitting it. If they cannot coexist in peace, and if you want peace, you must give up the idea of conflict entirely and for all time. This requires vigilance only as long as you do not recognize what is true. While you believe that two totally contradictory thought systems share truth, your need for vigilance is apparent. Your mind is dividing its allegiance between two kingdoms, and you are totally committed to neither. Your identification with the kingdom is totally beyond question, except by you when you are thinking insanely. What you are is not established by your perception and is not influenced by it at all. By it at all. All perceived problems in identification at any level are not problems of fact. They are problems in understanding because they mean that you perceive what you can understand as up to you to decide. The ego believes this totally being fully committed to it, but it is not true. The ego is therefore totally committed to untruth, perceiving in total contradiction to the perception of the Holy Spirit and to the knowledge of God. You can be perceived with meaning only by the Holy Spirit because your being is the knowledge of God. Any belief which you accept which is apart from this will obscure God's voice in you and will therefore obscure God to you. Unless you perceive His creation truly, you cannot know the Creator because God and His creation are not separate. The oneness of the Creator and the creation is your wholeness, your sanity, and your limitless power. This limitless power is God's gift to you because it is what you are. If you dissociate your mind mind from it, you are perceiving the most powerful force in the universe of thought as if it were weak, because you do not believe you are part of it. 
Perceived without your pardon at God's creation is perceived as weak, and those who see themselves as weakened do attack. The attack must be blind because there is nothing to attack. Therefore they make up images, perceive them as unworthy, and attack for their unworthiness. This is all that the world of the ego is. Nothing. It has no meaning. It does not exist. Do not try to understand it, because if you do, you are believing that it can be understood, and therefore is capable of being appreciated and loved. This would justify it, but it cannot be justified. You cannot make the meaningless meaningful. This can only be an insane attempt. Allowing insanity to enter your mind means that you have not judged sanity as wholly desirable. If you want something else, you will make something else, but because it is something else, it will attack your thought system and divide your allegiance. You cannot create in this divided state, and you must be vigilant against this divided state because only peace can be extended. Your divided mind is blocking the extension of the kingdom, and its extension is your joy. If you do not extend the kingdom, you are not thinking with your Creator and creating as He created. In this depressing state, the Holy Spirit reminds you gently that you are sad because you are not fulfilling your function as co-creator with God, and are therefore depriving yourself of joy. This is not God's will, but yours. If your will is out of accord with God's, you are willing without meaning. But because only God's will is unchangeable, no real conflict of will is possible. This is the Holy Spirit's perfectly consistent teaching. Creation, not separation, is your will because it is God's, and nothing that opposes this means anything at all. Being a perfect accomplishment, the sonship can only accomplish perfectly, extending the joy in which it was created and identifying itself with both its creator and its creations, knowing they are one. And now we are on day 111, section 5, The Denial of Power. This is Emily Bennington's notes or commentary. Mind is consistent. How I see one person will spread out and affect my perception of everyone, myself included. The ego gets this and opposes all love, all appreciation, and all truth. I have been straddling the fence between ego and the Holy Spirit, which has placed me in a state of conflict. Now I need to be vigilant for beliefs of the ego, remembering that reality is not up to me, and that only truth exists. Reflection This section states we need to be constantly vigilant against beliefs which are not, which are not true which is possible if we remember one thing, only the truth is true. If truth is total, the untrue cannot exist. Another way of saying this is that reality is not up to us to decide. Reality is not established by our perception. It is just what it is, regardless of what we think. This means that we are part of the kingdom no matter what. That is our identity, and nothing we can do can change it. How well do you see yourself and others through this lens? How vigilantly would you say you direct your thinking, and how can you be more vigilant in this remembering what is true and rejecting what is false? These are excerpts from the text. The mind that accepts attack cannot love. The ego, therefore, wants to engage your mind in its own delusional system because otherwise the light of your understanding will dispel it. 
Your divided mind is blocking the extension of the kingdom, and its extension is your joy. And I honestly love the last few paragraphs in this section. Paragraphs 13 through 15 are beautiful. Well, and I love the whole section, but it's a great section. But I really love those paragraphs. So I will conclude with, and I love you, and have a beautiful day, and thank you for walking with me on this journey. Thank you.